today on the Perception in Action podcast, the second episode in a series looking at the contributions of Paul Fitz to our understanding of motor control and motor learning. What is Fitz's three-phase model of skill acquisition? Why was it so influential? Is it really at complete odds with ecological approaches to skill acquisition? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to take a look at FIT's highly influential model of motor learning. This model, which I talked about back at episode 8, is arguably the most well-known information processing model of skill acquisition. For that reason, I think many people that are currently more aligned with ecological, non-linear approaches might not be all that interested in this topic. However, I think it's important to understand for a few reasons that I will dive into. To foreshadow, I think there are more commonalities between Fitz's model and the ecological approaches than most people think, and understanding these could be a way of bridging the two. Speaking of which, before I get going today, I wanted to mention the 2019 Sport Movement Skill Conference that will be run by Sean Mishka and will be held from May 16th through the 18th, 2019. The first meeting he held last year was fantastic. For this upcoming meeting, Sean has chosen the theme to be, quote, meeting in the middle for the sake of movement skill. So it will attempt to address some of these exact differences in theoretical and philosophical approaches to skill acquisition I've just been talking about. I will be giving the science keynote for the meeting, in which I'll try to outline some of the differences and similarities between information processing and ecological approaches to skill acquisition, and talk about how we might move forward, both in terms of theoretical and practical application. Sean also has many other great speakers lined up. Check out the link in the show notes and definitely consider coming if you can. Okay, let's dive into Fitz's model. Before getting into the details of the model, I think it's really important to understand where Fitz was coming from when he developed it. One of the things I really admire about Paul Fitz was that he was a true scholar. He thoroughly researched and analyzed previous research and theories, not only in his own area of study, but also in other scientific disciplines. He was one of the first to emphasize that we can't truly understand performance by isolating just motor control or just perception. Instead, we need a systems approach that considers all aspects of skill. For this reason, as he describes in his 1964 paper, Fitz's skill acquisition model is actually based on models from three different areas, communication, control systems, and adaptive systems. Communication models emphasize the role of information processing and use concepts like signal and noise and consider things like transmission, coding, and storage of information. The best example in Fitz's work is, of course, the topic I discussed in detail in the previous episode in this series, Fitz's Law. Control system models emphasize two things Fitz felt were critical in any performance model, using feedback for control and transfer functions. A transfer function is a mathematical representation of how inputs, i.e. perception, are converted into outputs, i.e. action. Finally, adaptive models are ones that can change their properties as a function of experience. That is, they can learn. So, as we will see shortly, Fitz's skill acquisition model is really a composite of communication control models, which includes systems dynamics, for example, transfer functions, and adaptations through the use of feedback. If all this talk is starting to make you think of concepts like coupling and dynamical systems, then I've made my point. Another thing that I think it's important to emphasize is that Fitz's thinking was shaped both by laboratory research and through the experiential knowledge of coaches and trainers. Quote, But there's a third approach to understanding of the nature of skill and skill training problems, the use of survey techniques which tap the experiences of the men and women who devote their working lives to training of young people in various skills. The rationale for studies which take as their data the experiences of instructors is perhaps obvious. Such studies certainly need no special justification. Nevertheless, two points should be made. First, instructors are intensely interested in certain aspects of task taxonomy. They are forced continually to think about factors in skill learning to try to understand the problems of the learner at various stages of training, and to program their instruction in relation to the nature of the skill task and the nature of the learner. Second, instructors have ample opportunity to study the progress of learners and to try out, 
albeit perhaps in an unsystematic way, different techniques of instruction. It therefore seems reasonable that much can be learned from the systematic collection and analysis of their experiences. End quote. Thus, Fitz was way ahead of his time in recognizing the value of the knowledge and experimentation done by practitioners working in the trenches. Okay, let's dive into some of the details of Fitz's model. In discussing this, I'm going to mostly look at two of his papers, Factors in Complex Skill Training, published in 1962, and Perceptual Motor Skill Learning, published in 1964. In his 1962 paper, Fitz first began by noting some key elements in terminology of skill. He noted that skill performance involves the following three characteristics. One, spatial temporal patterning. Two, continuous interaction between response processes with input and feedback processes. And three, learning. He argued that skilled activity can be specified in terms of two main things, the degree of body involvement and the extent to which the activity is externally paced. For the first of these, Fitz described the simplest type of task as one being which the body is at rest prior to initiating a response sequence, and the behavioral pattern is carried out in a relatively stable, unchanging environment. Many of the tasks we use in laboratory studies, such as reaction time or reaching paradigms, are of this type. At the next level of complexity, the behavior is initiated while either the body or the external objects being interacted with are in motion. Fitz's examples included shooting a basketball on the move or hitting a baseball. Here he argued that it's difficult to pick out any constancies in the behavioral pattern other than in looking at the success or failure of the complete movement sequence, because the relationships between inputs and outputs would be changing from execution to execution. For me, this sounds a lot like repetition without repetition. At the highest level of complexity in Fitz's taxonomy, both the individual and external objects are changing. For example, a quarterback throwing a pass on the move. For such tasks, Fitz acknowledges that, quote, it obviously would be very difficult to record the complete temporal spatial patterns of motion involved in such activities, and even more difficult to extract the constancies involved in successive sequences, i.e. to identify anything uniform in the behavior. Only the end result appears to be constant, and only by considering means and relationships is the nature of the constancies revealed, end quote. Again, I think he's ahead of his time a bit here in acknowledging the dynamic, nonlinear nature of motor control and the potential for redundancy in movement. Another of Fitz's major contributions to understanding was in highlighting the role of cognition in this process. Quote, The theoretical framework within which skilled performance is now being viewed by most students of this topic is such that sharp distinctions between verbal and motor processes or between cognitive and motor processes, serve no useful purpose. The processes which underlie skilled perceptual motor performance are very similar to those which underlie language behavior, as well as those which are involved in problem solving and concept formation. We should expect to find that laws of learning are also similar, and that no advantage would result from treating motor and verbal learning as separate topics. End quote. Fitz believed that the development of an intellectual understanding of the nature of a skill was critical to success, especially early in training. He noted that instructors and coaches use many different methods to help a learner gain this understanding, including observations, self-modeling, and directed attention. He also emphasized two other aspects, perceptual skills, which included learning what to look for and identifying important cues which we now associate with the education of attention in the ecological view. Finally, Fitz emphasized the importance of developing coordination between the movements of different body parts. Building off these basic concepts, Fitz described the emergence of a skill occurring through three stages or phases. Although he did make the point, quote, it must be emphasized, however, that these phases clearly overlap and that the progression from one to another is continuous rather than a discontinuous process. The three stages in order of their progression are cognitive, fixation, later described as the associative stage, and autonomous. In his 1964 paper, he also refers to these stages as early, intermediate, and late, but the content and features of each remain the same. The cognitive stage of skill acquisition is marked by a dependence on intellectual ability, acquiring specialized knowledge with the test of intellect and specialized knowledge being good predictors of the rate of learning in this stage. Quote, What to expect and what to do is emphasized. Procedures are described and information is provided about errors, which are often frequent. He emphasized that this phase is often quite short, 
covering only the time required to understand instructions, to complete a few preliminary trials, and to establish the proper cognitive set for the task. Performance in the second stage, the fixation stage, is identified with correct movement patterns, increased speed, and a reduction in errors to less than 1%. Fitz derived an estimate of the likely duration of this stage by looking at pilot training and proposed it was equivalent to about 100 hours of flying in preparation for initial solo and private pilot's license. The third stage, or autonomous phase, in addition to improvement in speed, accuracy, and diminished errors, approaching 0%, was characterized by increased resistance to stress, increased resistance to interference from other activities, and a decrease in the cortical association involvement that was interpreted as leading to greater control from lower brain centers. In his 1964 paper, Fitz gives an example of the progression through these three stages. Learning to swim provides a typical example of a skill that is learned against a complex background of already existing habits. The first hypothetical step in learning such a skill is the setting up of a general executive program. What usually happens in such a learning situation is that the performer listens to instructions, observes demonstrations, and tries out different routines which he already has available until somehow or other he gets started at learning the task. Verbal mediation plays an important role in this early stage. The actual sequence of behavioral processes employed early in learning varies with the type of activity, of course, but might be somewhat as follows. The performer observes or samples certain aspects of the environment, puts this information into short-term storage after some recoding, makes a decision such as selecting an appropriate subroutine, which sets up a response pattern, executes a short behavioral sequence, samples the internal and external feedback from this response, plus additional stimulus information from the environment, recodes and stores this new information, in the process losing some of the information already in short-term storage, makes another decision, which might be to use a different subroutine, and so on. As learning progresses, the subroutines become longer, the executive routine or overall strategy is perfected, the stimulus sampling becomes less frequent, and the coding more efficient. And different aspects of the activity become integrated or coordinated, such as kicking, breathing, and using the arms and swimming. In other types of perceptual motor tasks, such as those which are less coherent than swimming, the improvement may take the form of strategies and decision processes better adapted to the probabilities associated with stimulus sequences. As learning continues, overall performance may come to resemble more and more closely a continuous process. In his 1962 paper, Fitz goes on to describe some of the specific processes involved in each of these stages, in particular the development of subroutines which he defines as, quote, a sequence of operations that are called up on the basis of a single cue once the subroutine itself has been established. Obviously, this was heavily influenced by the emergence of computers at his time. In this paper, Fitz again uses swimming as an example of a skill that involves several subroutines, which instructors focus on separately in practice. For example, having a swimmer practice just kicking. So you can see here, he's getting into issues of part versus whole practice. In his 1962 paper, he ends with a couple implications for training. First, over-practice, which involves continuing to practice far beyond a point in time where some arbitrary criterion, like the number of hours, is reached. The importance of this is that many gains in skill, for example increased resistance to pressure and greater efficiency, can occur when there's no apparent change in performance outcomes occurring, an effect we often call over-learning now. His second suggestion was training in subroutines, that is, breaking apart a skill into its components where possible. The limitations of this type of part-task training, of which there are many, is something I've talked about a few times on the podcast now, in particular at the end of episode 35. In his writing, Fitz also emphasized the importance of using part-task training in the right situations. Quote, It is also desirable to provide additional training on the total complex task, of course particularly if there are any interactions between the subroutines. But often it is not feasible to provide facilities for extensive practice on the total task. In such instances, the use of part-task training is clearly indicated, provided this training can include complete subroutines. According to the general theory developed earlier, over-practice in one or more subroutines should make it much easier for the subject to learn additional new aspects of a complex task. End quote. So, to sum up today's episode and this series on FITS, although his three-stage model is often put forth in textbooks and papers 
As the preeminent example of an information processing approach to skill acquisition, I hope in today's episode, you've seen that there's more to it than that. A closer examination of Fitz's writing shows he was interested in the connection between behavior and biology, how the control of an action and the learning of an action can be thought of as similar processes, and the dynamic nature of skill, all concepts that are part of more recent approaches like ecological dynamics. So if you're interested in understanding motor learning and skill acquisition, I definitely recommend putting Fitz on your bookshelf next to Gibson and Bernstein. For more detail on Fitz's model and a look at research which has examined its basic predictions, please check out episode 8 of the podcast. Coming soon on the podcast, are there such things as generalized perceptual motor skills? Should we be testing for them and trying to improve them through training? Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. For this month, there's a bonus episode looking at some recent research examining the constraints-led approach. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now, and keep them coupled. We'll cut you quick.